cool. So, hello everyone, and welcome to the penultimate episode uh, of Nature, Nature Natters. Uh, my name is Gethin Jenkins Jones. I am the BTO youth rep for Cardiff, uh, and helping me out today is Jasmine, a rep for Bangor. Um, and we'll now quickly go through the house rules before we get started uh, with Mary. So, uh, over to you, Jasmine. Brilliant. Thank you, Gethin. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to run through a couple of house rules uh, for the event this evening. So we're just going to ask if you could keep yourselves muted while Mary is talking, just so we don't get any background noise there. And um, if you could change your names, uh, your Zoom names to just your first name and the initial of your last name, that'd be great. Um, so we're going to be doing um, about 20 minutes of a talk from Mary and then a Q&A section at the end. So if you have any questions that you think of during the talk, you can pop them in the chat and we'll read them out at the end. Or if it gets to the Q&A section and you'd prefer to read them out loud, just let us know and then you can unmute yourselves and ask your questions. And just to finish off, um, we are gonna be recording the session which to be published on YouTube at a later date. So if you would prefer to keep your cameras off during the recording, then we suggest you do that now. So back to you, Gethin. Cool, thanks Jasmine. So today I'm privileged uh, to host and welcome environmentalist author and producer, Mary Colwell. So uh, a tenacious campaigner, uh, one of Mary's most profound legacies so far has been her notorious efforts to raise awareness uh, of the plight of the curlew in Britain. And uh, I'm sure she'll be talking about that in a bit, so I won't go to too much spoilers now. Uh, but she's since written a book about the species uh, called Curly Moon, uh, as well as a, another recent publication called uh, Beak, Tooth and Claw. Uh, and I've got both these books with me uh, now, and I've read them both, Mary, and I think they're very beautifully written. And I would definitely, definitely recommend uh, any of you guys um, to, uh, to buy these books. Beak, Beak, Tooth and Claw uh, talks about our uh, relationship with the predators um, of uh, of Britain, things like foxes. Give that man a brownie point, Aaron. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you've written a book on John Muir as well, haven't you, Mary? Um, so uh, yeah, there's there's uh, three books for you to get. Um, so yeah, uh, and in addition to all this, Mary has uh, been an avid campaigner for more nature uh, in our educational curriculum, something I'm sure we all agree on. And we have some recent su success in that, haven't we? Because uh, in the news about a month or two ago, uh, I believe uh, OCR is it now have agreed to add it, uh, add natural history uh, to their list of uh, GCSEs. So a big congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Uh, so yeah, Mary, before I give you the floor, uh, just a very quick question. Uh, how has 2022 uh, been for you so far and what are you most looking forward to in the months ahead? Do you know, 2022 so far has been really good. Thank you. Um, it's been phenomenally busy, but it's been a really good year. It started off well because uh, we went away just for a few days to the North Norfolk coast in early January, because one of the must see things are the geese, aren't they? the winter geese in Norfolk. And, um, and we went over to stay in North Norfolk and just, just watch the geese, it got cold and just thought, this is such a spectacle. Uh, if you go to the wash, when you get the sort of the tide changing and everything sort of flies over your head and it's just all the waders and the soundscape of calling birds and the geese in the air. So that was, well, how could you not start the year off well with that? Um, but it has been really busy because lots of things have taken off. And as you said, uh, this is the year that the GCSE was announced by the government. It's taken 11 years of campaigning, but here we are. And it will be in schools at the latest 2025. We're yeah. hoping to try and push it to 2024, but there's a lot to do to get it ready for schools. But uh, yeah, so, so far I would say it's going well. And actually so far, we're not far off halfway through, are we? My goodness. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, great. So I'll now hand over the floor to you. And yeah, don't, don't worry uh, if you only end up talking uh, for about 10, 15 minutes, because we've got a lot of backup questions um, with us today. Um, so yeah, and afterwards we'll um, we'll be going on uh, to the Q and A, um, and we'll try and finish about five minutes early because I believe you need to be somewhere afterwards. Yes, right. straight on to another thing. But um, it's just wonderful to to have the opportunity to talk to you, and thank you everybody for for coming tonight. That's really lovely to see you. I recognise a few names from Twitter, but um, it's really nice to see you. Um, okay, just a little bit about me. I was I was sort of brought up in Stoke on Trent. So right in the middle of the country, it's that sort of place no one goes to between Birmingham and Manchester. 
um, very industrial. It's not really a city as in Manchester or Birmingham or London. It's really a string of towns, six towns. Um, so there isn't really a center. It's not really a city, but it's called the city of Stoke-on-Trent. Um, but it has fantastic history, uh, which I love. I love all the sort of industrial history of Stoke, but I also love the fact that it sits right on the edge of the Peak District. And if there's a sort of landscape that means an awful lot to me, it's the Peak District, the Southern Peak, Dr Peak District in particular. Uh, that sort of limestoney White Peak and the Roaches area, that kind of place. I love it. I really love it. And I spent a lot of time in my childhood there. And I think I began my love of the natural world in that part of the world. I used to go with my dad and we'd go for walks um, up onto the hills and, and through the valleys and the limestone valleys. And, and we weren't naturalists. I would never, ever claim that. But I would say that my dad instilled in me a tremendous reverence for the natural world. And that stayed with me all my life. And he was really interested. We both of us kept trying to learn the names of wildflowers and both of us were hopeless. And I still to this day have real difficulty with flower names. I, I try very hard, but I'm not that good at it. But I did love walking and nature in its broadest sense. And I absolutely loved finding fossils in the rocks. And occasionally we'd take a hammer and we'd pick up a piece of rock fallen from a wall or just scattered on the ground in the limestone area. And one day we cracked open this rock and there inside was a perfectly formed shellfish. Uh, and I, I, I could still be emotional today at finding that in the rock. It was the first time anyone had ever seen this shellfish that swam in the oceans millions upon millions of years ago. And there we were in the middle of the country, no sea for, you know, a couple of hundred miles at least. And yet he was a shellfish in the limestone valley in the Southern Peak District. And I just, just blew my mind, to be honest. And I took it back and I drew it and I learned its name. And I, and from then on got really hooked into the past, I think you could say. And I ended up going to university uh, in the end to study uh, geology, earth sciences. And my first love was rocks and earth processes, how the planet came to be as it is. And it's a fascinating story. The rocks are just a big storybook, really, that are telling us about all the past eras and times of mountain buildings and the times of oceans and the deserts and the rivers and the storms and the weird and wonderful life that was on this planet before us. I still love it very much as a subject. So I did a degree in geology and um, couldn't quite decide what to do with my life. So I ended up um, actually starting uh, my first job was nothing to do with nature at all. It was in a patent agent. So if you know what a patent agent is, it's if you come up with an, uh, an invention and you want to protect it so that nobody else can steal your invention, you go and have it written up by a patent agent. So I wrote up inventions <laughs> for a while and I, actually wrote up an invention which I one I still love because uh, I did this job in Halifax in Yorkshire is somebody had invented a special dog bag it's a special bag to carry your whippet home after the races and it was a big sort of fluffy bag that made your whippet all feel nice and warm after it was all sweaty after racing and I still think that is the oddest thing I've probably I've ever done um, but patent agenting wasn't for me I had this yearning really to 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 get back to the natural world in some way. I couldn't quite define it, but in some way. And to cut a long story short, I ended up working for the Open University um, in the days when they made films and you're probably way too young because it doesn't really happen now, but the Open University put films on the television of professors and doctors talking about subjects. And they were like lectures you watched on the telly. And so I ended up working in that for a while. And I ended up working um, writing the texts for the geology courses and also making the films. And then through making those films, transitioned over to the BBC Natural History Unit, um, where I worked then for a quarter of a century, making wildlife documentaries, both television and radio. So uh, wildlife documentaries like Wildlife and One and Natural World, um, some of the big series say British Isles and Natural History with Alan Titchmarsh, some stuff with Bill Oddie, 
I made radio series. We did a bit with David Attenborough as narrator. Um, and also lots and lots of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of programs on Radio 4, mainly nature programs and documentaries. Um, but then after a while, I wanted to do something different again. It was a wonderful career and, and it really is a fabulous career, but you're always one step removed from the actual hands-on conservation side, the actual animals themselves. You're always sort of that step away. And the world just seemed to me to really be crying out for help. And there were, of course, so many good people and good things happening, but I wanted to get involved. And really it was my love of curlews that um, took me away from broadcasting and into conservation. You know, when someone says to you, um, what's your favorite animal? And Everybody, if I ask that to this little group here, everybody, put it in the chat. What's your favorite animal? God, I'd love to know. And if you could put it in the chat, tell me what your favorite animal is. It doesn't have to be a bird, but I imagine a lot of you will have birds. And if it is, uh, just whatever it is, tell me why. And I think you'll find that quite hard. I do. When people say, why curlews? Um, I don't know. They're just nice, aren't they? They're just beautiful and they they're kind of like sculptures and they're they're quite big so you can actually see them they're all sort of rounded and curved they've got little round heads and long necks and really plumpy body with long stilty legs and very long sculptural downward curving bill and um beautiful i'm gonna have a quick look on the glasses on come on red kite excellent storm petrol now then kate Storm Petrol, my husband would be absolutely right with you on that one. Uh, House Martin, nice. Yeah, Black Guillemot, excellent, Nuthatch. Look at all that, Armadillo, oh yeah, a new one which somebody would have an old bird, excellent. Really nice to see those. But if you actually had to describe in detail, well, that and, you know, as opposed to anything else, you kind of think, well, it just appeals, doesn't it? So, um, the curly just appeals. It appeals because of the way it looks. It appeals because of the way it sounds. And it appeals because of the places it lives in. Um, so it looks beautiful, as I said, all roundy and funny. It makes me laugh as well as make me think it's beautiful. It's sort of a bit like a pinhead, isn't it? With a big long bill. I always think it looks quite funny, but on the other hand, it's so elegant and gorgeous. Um, I love the way it sounds. That bubbling call. Does everybody, everybody know how, what a curlew sounds like? Yeah. Um, the breeding call that you hear most at the moment, that beautiful rising bubbling sort of as though the landscape itself is boiling over that kind of sound. Um, and the long curly call, they've got lots and lots of different calls, but all of them are rather beautiful and they fire out and fill landscapes. And I love that. And there's something intriguing about a curlew's call. At times it's ecstatic and happy sounding, but it's also got this, this, these strains of sadness to it. And that's because the curlew kind of intermixes and interweaves between major and minor keys. It slides around, it does all kinds of extraordinary things. And to our ears, we can't quite decide whether it's happy or sad. And it's very tantalizing sound. So I love it for that reason. But I also love the places they live. I love, always loved wide, flat places like marshes and mud flats and big expanses of coastline. Love that. I love horizons. I love flat looking out to the horizon. And then there's this lovely bird in the middle of it. That really appeals to me. So I love the coast where they spend the winter, but also when they come inland to breed. I also love meadows, wildflower meadows and the ordinary farmer's fields where you can just walk through and they're just there. They're just our everyday landscapes, but they're made magical by this bird. And, and then the lower mountain slopes and the moors where they nest as well. They're kind of on more, they're less visited and more remote. And that bird seems to fit in there as well. So curlews fit high ground, they fit farmer's fields, they fit mud flats and marshes and by the sea. So they tie all these landscapes together for me. 
And the curlew just did it. It just is a bird I can love. Um, when I found out how badly they were doing, um, 2015 British Birds published a paper identifying the curlew as the UK's greatest conservation concern for birds. That is such a shock. Um, you know, you still see them, is it really that bad? Um, and I just needed to find out more. And so I did this big walk and I am someone who loves to walk actually. And I am somebody who loves to walk on my own. I love walking on my own. Um, and so I set off on a 500 mile walk from the west coast of Ireland, right the way through to the east coast of England. So I walked through Ireland, through Wales, through England, from west coast of Ireland to the Wash, straight through. And I chose that route because it went from places where there are curlews, winter curlews, curlews still breeding in some of those places, but it also passed through the places where they are no more. And the fields are now silent and they don't sing with curlew song anymore. And I wanted to talk to scientists and conservationists and painters and artists. And I just wanted to talk to anybody who would talk to me about their love of curlews, what they thought about them, why they think they're disappearing and what we can do about it. And that walk was transformational really for me. It, it took me right into the heart of our landscapes and right into and in front of the people that live and work there, the scientists who are studying there, conservationists who are trying to make it better, but the ordinary everyday people, just people like you and me, who just love nature and want to do something. And, we, and also those people who didn't seem interested and didn't really care. And so it was a fascinating walk. It was a fascinating walk from the landscape point of view, from the bird point of view, but also from the human point of view, because it meant I could talk to people who are like real BTO, RSPB, WWT conservation type people, but also people who have a different perspective on life and people who have to make a living from the land, who haven't got much time to worry about conservation, like farmers, and but also perhaps some of the people who um, have country sports or you know sport shooting have a different perspective on the natural world and it's and it was really important for me to talk to everybody to try to understand different points of view I've always found that very important and the BBC is really good and in, in my in my training as a BBC program maker to try to be even-handed to, to listen and understand not make judgments not be too quick to make judgments but to understand try to balance arguments. So that's when Curly Moon, Ray, got written. And, um, and that has been well received because I think for the first time, this bird was brought into the popular culture really, as opposed to being a very much a bird of conservation concern. I tried to make it a very popular book full of poetry and art and literature. Um, I'm not a professional conservationist, so you know it was a book written for people like me, really. So uh, after that, it got me thinking even more about conservation, um, because curlews are very sort of um, how is the best word to say it? Curlews don't don't invite controversy. They don't people nobody. I never met anybody who didn't like a curlew. I didn't meet anybody who wanted to shoot one or eat one or didn't like them because they ate their crops or they carried diseases, you know. Curlews just are, they're just there. And if people know them, they really like them. So curlews in themselves are not controversial, but curlews do find themselves in very controversial places on grouse moors, in the middle of a silage field, in a field where people want to build houses, um, in the middle of fields where people want to walk their dogs, and let their dogs off the leads and so on. So the curlew is where people want to plant forests an increasingly big problem. So curlews find themselves unwittingly in the middle of some of the biggest conservation issues this country faces. And so that's why I wrote the next book, Beak, Tooth and Claw, Yay. Um, to try to not so much come to any firm conclusions, but just to lay out some of the big issues that we face 
why predators in particular cause us so many issues, why people get very worked up and passionate about predators, hen harriers and peregrines and foxes and badgers and so on. Um, and, and try and take some of the heat out of the arguments and just try to lay out the issues so that people can make their own minds up about what they thought about it. And so that was a really, uh, I would say it's not a book I particularly liked. It's not, it wasn't, I didn't enjoy it like I did Curly Moon, but I felt, found it a very important book for me to write anyway. And I hope people found the, the non-controversial approach to the issues helpful. Um, and in the mean of all this, I still carry on doing curly conservation, um, very interested in the relationship between nature and culture. So I'm uh, part of a group called New Networks for Nature, which puts an event on every year, which brings together scientists and artists to talk about the natural world from different points of view. So I do that. And I'm also writing my fourth book, um, which is uh, in, in between lockdowns in 2020, so we had a big spring lockdown, which everybody, you know, was very sort of frightening really. And then we had a bit of release. And then before we locked down again, around about Christmas, end of 2020. And um, in that, in between time, I went and walked across Northern Spain, another 500 mile walk from the Pyrenees right the way through to a place called the Santiago de Compostela. Um, it's a pilgrimage walk, a thousand years old, one of the oldest pilgrimage routes in the world. And uh, I walked that in the sort of time of COVID, really. And uh, a, a route which normally has a third of a million people walking it a year, I had it to myself. And I walked this route almost entirely alone, which was quite a, quite a thing. And the book is about all the things that I came across, the nature I came across, and the sort of how, what it was like to walk through Spain at a time when the world was in a crisis. So um, that's where I am, am now. I was made chair of the Curlew Recovery Partnership just about a year ago. And the Curlew Recovery Partnership was set up by DEFRA uh, in recognition of the seriousness of the decline of curlews. Um, that it was decided to bring all the, some major, not all, some major organizations together BTO, RSPB, uh, Game of Wildlife, uh, My Little Charity, Curlew Action, uh, Natural England, oh, I was a host of them. And that's the steering group. And together we sort of face these knotty issues that curlews face and try to help and connect people and come up with policy and, and help the government, all that kind of stuff. And I'm chair of the Curly Recovery Partnership, working very closely with a manager called Russell Wynn. So I do that as well. Um, yeah, and I run my charity, Curly Action, and we're very, very busy at the moment because we're fundraising with a singer-songwriter called David Gray. You're way too young to know, but he was a great big star in the turn, sort of about the 2000s. He's done a lot of music since, but he was very famous then for, and he's doing a world tour at the moment and raising money for Curlews through that. So we're all very busy. Curlews are still a sort of, have a great big sort of um, place in my heart. Um, but that's not to say I don't feel passionate about the natural world, all of it, and want to do what I can what, in whatever way I can. And whether I bring anything different or not is for others to decide. But if I can bring something to the table, help people talk, and all of us work together for a better future for wildlife then that's what i'm going to do till i can't do it anymore and that's me thanks uh thanks uh mary um so yeah you're happy to start the q a uh, yeah, i believe so i've just got some questions here on uh Cooley moon uh so one thing that i noticed uh about it whilst reading there was a lot of poetry in there um in fact, I think I wrote down my favorite bit. What was it? Um, uh, a crescendo sound bubbles bursting in cadence of liquid joy. I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you remember writing that. Yeah. And uh, it just got me wondering, um, has poetry always been important to you? And were you surprised how much poetry there's been written about the curlew uh, in preparation for making the book? Yeah, I think I, I do love poetry. Uh, I love short stories and I love poetry particularly. I like that sort of 
contained form of words like that. Because I think you can very, a good poet or writer quickly creates words, uh, creates worlds out of a few words. And poets are particularly clever at that. So I'm, I'm not very good at the very complicated poetry. I'm not very good at that. But poetry um, that's fairly like simple, it's not simple as in easy to write, but has, um, is accessible. I've always loved it. And yes, was I surprised. I couldn't believe how many references there were to curlews in poetry, in stories, um, in folklore, in religion, um, in, in the in the sounds, you know, in, in the background of films. If anybody, if everybody wants to, if a filmmaker wants to say wilderness, there's two sounds you'll always hear. One is the mewing of a buzzard and the other is the call of a curlew. And those two seem to signify, right, we're now in a wild place. Um, and so it was a real surprise. And some of the stories associated with curlews were very surprising to me. Um, I always uh, associate curlews with really lovely feelings of happiness when I see them. Like, I get really happy when I see a curlew. But a lot of the folklore is about curlews being harbingers of doom and bringing bad luck. And sailors in Ireland, they would say, if, if you set out to go fishing in your little boat in the west coast of Ireland, the curlew is calling as it flies over your boat, turn back for shore because there's going to be terrible storms or... In Wales, they said, if you hear a curlew calling at night, you know, there's going to be a death in the family and all sorts of terrible things. <laughs> so, and I, I was intrigued as to where these negative things came from because I never felt that about curlews. But I think probably they have quite a haunting call. And if you do hear it at night, that's probably a little bit scary. Um, and I think in times gone by when we didn't feel you know, when we were very much more at the, at the, at the, at the whim of the natural world, uh, much more so than we are mostly today, not everywhere, but mostly, um, then I think probably we looked to certain species to sort of as omens for things and the poor little curl you got landed with some negativity, but it's intriguing. It's intriguing, it attracted such diverse opinions. But yes, poetry and literature, there is a lot of it. A lot of famous writers loved it, and a lot of beautiful poems are written about it, and now a lot of music. Yeah. Cool. So we've got quite a bit of action uh, on the chat now, so I'll, I'll just stick to asking one more question then, actually, before we we get to the um, get to the others. Um, so uh, after or or even during, I think uh, a couple of times uh, your walk um, across the country. Uh, to raise awareness uh, of the curlews. You did some workshops uh, with landowners and, and farmers, etc. cetera. Um, I'd be interested to know um, how you invited them. How, how did you get them to attend? Because I, I know they can be quite um, a reserved bunch, quite conservative in their nature that they don't, don't like to participate in things. How, how did you entice them uh, to come to some of these events that you uh, hosted? I think, I think what really helped is that I just did it as an individual. And I think if there's a take home message for you guys today, it's you don't have to belong to a big organization to make a difference. That if you feel passionate about something, just you can make a difference. So I did the curly walk as I like to call it on my own, un unaffiliated to any organization. And then when we set up uh, these big conferences, I wrote to people as just me. So I didn't have a badge, I didn't have an affiliation, I didn't have um, a sort of sign over my head and I am the RSPB or I am GWCT or something. And so I think people felt that because I was seen as an independent figure that they, they felt they could go without worrying about conflict. Mm. And I think one of the biggest problems in conservation today is there's a lot of conflict and, and I think social media makes that a lot worse than it should be in reality. Um, and very often you find that people who can sort of really get angry with each other on social media, if, you, if you're in a room and you've got a cup of tea and a piece of cake and you're focusing on something non-controversial like a curlew, as opposed to something that's got a lot of angst about it, um, then people can, you know, you find that we're all human beings and actually we all want a better world. Now we may have different views about how to get there, but at least 
we're human beings who want to make the world a better place. And that's a very good place to start. So I think being independent, being passionate, being non-judgmental, being welcoming and saying, I actually really genuinely want to listen to you. I genuinely want to know how you think. And I genuinely want to know how we can work together. That was enough to bring a lot of disparate people together. Mm. And yeah, just a, a, a quick follow on from that, because um, uh, you did say the key to success uh, lay in stressing the effectiveness of local independent action concentrated solely on curlews and not run by established mainstream organisations. So just my follow up question on that, what would you say, what role should big organisations like the RSPB, what role should they have uh, if that's the case in uh, conserving curlews? I think um, I, I think, you know, everybody has a different place. So. Uh, the RSPB do a fantastic job doing the job that the RSPB does and the BTO does a great job doing the job the BTO does and and so on so I don't think everybody should change I just think don't feel that you have to just be a member of those organizations to do something because you're an agent of change in in and of yourself so if you feel that the RSPB completely represents you and that you that's what you want to do and represent the RSPB then fantastic really fantastic but sometimes you might think and, and I think that is probably just something to do with me is I'm I am a bit of a sort of I don't I like doing things on my own <laughs> I like I like sort of just getting on and doing stuff and sometimes organizations can be a little bit sort of hem you in a bit so um, it just suits my personality probably just to go and do it and invite everybody along and treat everybody with respect and I have huge respect for the different organisations we've talked about, huge respect. Um, and so I don't think there's anything wrong. There's no, no right and no wrong. It's just where you feel you fit and where you feel you can have your voice. But don't be intimidated out of having a voice just because you don't belong to a big organisation is what I'm saying. Because you're really important in your own right and your voice is really important in its own right, probably much more so than you realise. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, Jasmine, we've got some uh, questions in the chat. Uh, would you like to take over for the next uh, five minutes or so and, and, and call people? Because I know we've got a mixture of written questions uh, for you, Mary, and also some people who want to ask you questions uh, in person. Uh, so, yeah, over to you, Jasmine, for um, selecting. But I think it might be best to go through an order. Um, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Gethin. Um, firstly, I'll just say thank you very much, Mary, for taking the time to join us this evening and to talk us through some of the wonderful conservation things you've done. And I've got to say that was some really lovely inspirational words from you there. So I'm very pleased to hear thank you. those. Um, we've got some nice questions coming from everyone, uh, which I'm looking forward to hearing about. But uh, first of all, um, Danny, if you would like to unmute and ask your question now, uh, absolutely go for it. Uh, thanks, Jasmine. Um, hi, Mary. It's great hi, to see you. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, it seemed like when you were doing your research for your books, especially for Beak Tooth and Claw, you had to deal a lot with very traditional landowners who conservationists are often seen at odds with and are often, um, it's often drawn into a, a fairly vicious debate. And I was wondering, how did you bridge the gap between what could be seen as two sides of a the same coin if you understand where I'm coming from yeah no it's a very good question and, and um, I wish I knew really I think I just <laughs> that's one of the things you just do is just go and do it so for example when I first met one of the landowners that I work with a bit um, up in the Yorkshire Dales the very first thing I said to him I said hello you know thank you for inviting me onto your grouse moor um, uh, very you know pleased to meet you but you know I don't think we're that similar really I don't shoot I've never shoot shot I never will shoot I don't like shooting um in fact I'm a vegetarian and I actually quite a lot of the time I'm a vegan so I sort of have lapses you know <laughs> so, and I said and I'm probably more left wing than right wing so probably on paper we're not going to get on that well but I've but you know, but nevertheless, I'm delighted to be here. And he said, I agree, but I think we're going to get on fine. And we do. And we are friends. And I don't agree with everything he says. And he certainly doesn't agree with everything I say. 
but we teach, treat each other with respect. And I think all of us shift. And I think the thing about, about trying to um, address a conflict is not to go into a conflict thinking, I'm gonna make you think like me, right? No matter, I don't care what you think, you're gonna end up thinking like me. Never works, never works. And, it, and all it does is deepen the divide. If you go and say, you and I disagree, but let's, let's have a very frank discussion. And out of that, maybe we'll come, maybe both of us will shift a bit. And maybe we'll both come out and think about things slightly differently. And we'll have something that's a bit new to deal with. So go into it with the point of view that you're gonna create a new vision, which helps accommodate different points of view. Then you're in a much better place to start talking. And I think that's always my approach. And you're right. And sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes people just will not listen. But you know, if people don't listen, then that's their decision. And you just drop it and go around and go on talk to the next person. Don't ever, ever, ever let setbacks stop you. Never, never let setbacks stop you. Just keep going. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Good. Thank you for a really good question, Danny, and thank you, Mary, for a brilliant answer as well. Um, we've also had another request um, to ask a question out loud. So, Rufus, if you'd like to ask your question, the floor is all yours. Sorry, not quite as interesting a question as Danny's, but there's not much detail online yet. So what sort of content does the Natural History GCSE cover, please? Uh, what sort of subjects will it cover? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so if you think, um, what does it take to be a naturalist? So uh, what do you need to do to be a naturalist? You need to be able to uh, observe things, name them, record them, collect data about them, follow them through the seasons, uh, whether that be a tree or a bird or a flower, whatever it is, um, <coughs> a range of different wildlife. But you need real skills to be able to do that properly. Uh, you know, a lot of, I'm sure you've all, you guys have all benefited from people teaching you things. Um, well, some people aren't that lucky. Some people don't have people to teach them. So I want the GCSE to teach people how to be naturalists, not to be afraid of the natural world, but to be fascinated by it. So to go out there and say, I've only got a little garden or a park down the road or a few trees in the, you know, down the street. But whatever it is, there's stuff there that's going to fascinate me. And I'm going to draw it and name it and record it and understand it. And I'm going to understand how my little patch of wildlife, the world of wildlife just around me, relates to the wildlife of uh, Britain and how the wildlife of Britain relates internationally. So like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, seeing swifts, wow, suddenly I'm, I'm connected to Africa. And that's really exciting. So the Natural History GCSE will be about creating the naturalists of the future, but it will also have that layer that we talked about as well, um, which is that the connection between nature and inspiration. So I'd really like to see some element of nature as it's um, shown in writing and poetry and music and art and music, that kind of thing as well. So we haven't written it yet, we're about to start, but I'm going to, um, that's what I would like to see in it anyway. Great, thanks. Does that help? Will it be an optional um, GCSE, Mary? Yeah, it'd be one of those that you choose, like history or music or something. Okay. And yeah, I mean to get it as a as a subject which is um, you know which is compulsory is almost impossible. That would be too much of a leap for the government, and we would never have done that. So I had to take advice on that from the people who know, and it took eleven years to get it to this stage. So. Yeah. So we'll just keep going and, and hopefully it will spread and develop. And I think we'll see a general greening of the cu curriculum where natural history will be a lot more present in a lot more subjects anyway. Yeah, I'm definitely hoping that'll be the case in Wales as well. We've, we've yeah. evolved here. Um, I've spoken about it um, here and there. And I looked, at the, um, I looked at the WJEC and I wasn't impressed at all. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, hopefully hopefully I can see some changes. Yeah, I really yeah. hope so. I hope Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland will follow suit as well. 
So I can see that Kia's asked a question. Um, we'll come back to yours, Kia. I just want to skip to Charlie's because it still relates to the um, Natural History GCSC. So Charlie's asked a really uh, nice question here, uh, Mary. So I'll, I'll read it out to you. Uh, on campaigning for your Natural History GCSC, what did you find to be the most effective? Um, what do you find to be most effective uh, in getting listened uh, to it uh, by those at the top uh, and through all the jurisdictions? Uh, is it sheer uh, persistence or uh, was there a particular way you found uh, made, that made most uh, headway? Okay, two, two, a uh, really good question, thank you. Um, okay, there's not that many advantages to being me, but one of them is I will not give up, I just won't. And um, if I think something's worthwhile and I feel passionate about it, then I will just keep being passionate about it till someone listens. So just not giving up. If you give up because you fail in the first year or something, then honestly, that's that's not gonna be very helpful in the future. So I didn't give up, but I also spoke to people in language that you understand, that everybody understands. So I think uh, science and conservation, for example, or the educational world, the world of sort of education can have its own lingo and, and have its own sort of way of speaking. And that can be a bit um, intimidating if you're not in that world. So when I spoke, spoke to professional education people, uh, people not I don't mean teachers, I mean people who understand the education system and so on. I sometimes I have a clue what people were talking about. <laughs> it was really hard sometimes to understand. Um, and I think I just, just speaking from your heart and just saying, I, this really matters to me because I think that wildlife it's so important to us because we rely on it. It inspires us. Where would we be without it? We depend on it. It takes us into all kinds of exciting places. It's good for our mental health. It's good for our economy. It's good for, um, you know, young children growing up. It, just on every level, natural history is vital. So we need to put it into the heart of education. And it's speaking a bit like that got people to listen to me, I think. And then Caroline Lucas, the turning point, you do need luck in campaigns. If you keep going, it will come your way, but you do need to keep going and you do need to believe luck will come your way. And luck came my way in the form of Caroline Lucas, who then helped get me in front of the Secretary of State for the Environment, who at that point was Michael Gove, and then in front of uh, Ministers for Education. Um, and once you get in front of people and you can look into the whites of their eyes, you, you're onto a different ball game, really. That's what it is. So don't give up. Get the right people on side and speak from the heart. Can I ask uh, how she got in contact with you? Uh, on Twitter. She on sent Twitter. me a personal message on Twitter and we fell off my seat. Couldn't believe it. Um, I mean, there's quite a few times I've been really surprised. And that was really was a surprise. I mean, she's been such a hero of mine for so long. And suddenly there was this personal message on Twitter. It was amazing. So thank you, Caroline. <laughs> she gets her to come and talk to you guys. I bet she'd love it. Yeah, yeah. Note that down, Faye, um, quickly. Uh, uh, cool. So I think just just go back to um, his question. But honestly, I think some of us uh, already know the answer. A uh, chance for you to talk about your first book. Who would you say has inspired you the most uh, in your writing and career? Well, um, that's probably difficult to pick. I think, can I choose a person in the past? <laughs> can I choose John Muir? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was hoping you were going to say that. It was uh, my <laughs> first book comment would, wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, yeah, go, 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 go ahead, Mary. John Muir. Um, <laughs> if you don't know who John Muir is, um, he was born in 1838 in Scotland. And then when he was about 10 years old, his family took, uh, his father took the family over to America and they lived as frontier farmers you know and it was a very hard life and they were very devout Christian family very strict um, but out of all the sort of hardship and the, and the turmoil <clears throat> excuse me John Muir fell in love with the natural world and um, he ended up um, basically establishing America's national parks <clears throat> and he lived alone in the Yosemite Valley in California, in the mountains in California. And that sort of those years he, he spent as a kind of semi-hermit living in mountains were really, really important. 
and uh, he communed with nature, he understood the geology, he, he absolutely fell in love with the nature of the Yosemite and the, the, the Sierra Nevada mountains. And his writing is some of the most beautiful and expressive that I know. He, he writes as though you're sitting right next to him, as though you're talking to him. And I love that. He, it's as like he's the best dinner guest ever, you know, and just, just inspires you with his words. And when I read it, I just felt like I was walking with him in mountains. I just loved it. I mean, some people find him a bit too much, but does it for me. So I would say John Muir was a really important person. Um, and somebody else who was a bit more contemporary, uh, I think Roger Deakin, um, who wrote Waterlog, <clears throat> was such an eye-opening book for me. It was quite a, a world-changing book for me. So those two people, there's lots, I mean, lots of wonderful people who write lots of wonderful stuff. But if I picked out two just sitting here, those be the two at the moment. Very nice. And I think I'd agree, actually. Um, one funny story I think you like, uh, Mary. Um, I think the last time I got a um, stocking from Santa, uh, so to speak, was 2014 or 2015. And that John Muir book was in that. Oh, no, book. really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent.